Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to The Lookout. Today is the 4th of September, Sunday, and we're going to talk about the, the mill fire and weed, the mountain fire between Scott Valley and Shasta Valley, Rum Creek fire in uh, southwest Oregon, and we'll check out the Cedar Creek fire in central, uh, west central Oregon. don't think we're going to cover the SRF lightning complex today because it, there wasn't really anything new to report on the infrared. Things are looking good over there. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, my name is Zeke Lunder. I'm a wildfire analyst, and uh, this is Jasper, who's my assistant. And um, we do reporting on wildfire from here in Chico, California. Um, I've been working in mapping on fires um, for a long time, and so we use the tools from uh, that we've kind of learned through doing mapping for agencies during wildfires uh, for public information. So this is publicly accessible data that we kind of run through our secret sauce tools here and then narrate for you guys to give you an idea of what's happening with wildfire. Uh, Lookout's really interested in forestry, fuels management, ways we can make our communities more safe from fire. So our goal is to help improve everyone's fire literacy. So welcome to the Lookout and we're gonna jump in here and we're gonna talk about the mill fire and weed. So here's infrared mapping from the fire. Um, it got flown last night. And the main thing to say about the fire itself is that there hasn't been a lot of spread on the fire since the um, day before yesterday when the fire really made its run. So the fire started here at um, in the vicinity of this mill building. Uh, we still don't really know uh, what started the fire, but Early on, there's uh, imagery of this whole huge building just really quickly engulfed in flames and then embers um, and spot fires way out from it. So the fire <coughs> took off from the mill here and immediately uh, really took out these two neighborhoods. One thing that um, I saw a comment about yesterday is just that um, when we see these maps and things are solid on the map, it doesn't mean that there's not houses out there within there within the burn that um, survived. It's just that this is generally where the the fire is hot. <coughs> so the fire, some of this um, field that looks green on this imagery isn't green now, um, but the fire did kind of have some irrigated lands that it kind of skirted around and even though there's no heat showing out here the fire did burn this whole area so we're looking we're kind of north of <coughs> we now looking at where the fire kind of fingered into Lake Shastina neighborhood and as I said before there are homes within this perimeter that did survive the fire once the fire got here it hit the lake and it hit the golf course and the winds kind of stopped um, being quite as severe and we had a lot of resources um, tanker drops in the neighborhood a lot of firefighters out here that stopped the fire before it could advance farther in which um, you know, there's a lot of homes out here as you move farther into Lake Shastina so um, really fortunate that the fire only gotten <coughs> to the neighborhoods as far as it did I uh, want to say that just um, having quick access to this um, data like we did during the fire is a new thing and everyone's kind of trying to figure out how best to how to best to deliver it and uh, you know there's kind of an active debate going on about um, how much information to make public quickly um, whether or not you know um, well I'll just say that we're kind of on the ragged edge of that and um, we want to make sure that we're getting it right we don't want to traumatize people with um you know, seeing their house has burned on a map, but also um, there's just kind of this question for me of, um, you know, if we've got 1,500 people out here wondering if their house burned, if we should be withholding um, mapping information and everything else um, to protect the, um, you know, the couple dozen people that were uh, that were impacted by it. So we're going to try to, you know, do our best to negotiate that um, fine line in our work um it's uh, we, we realize it's really delicate 
and um, hopefully you know the um, the benefit of people being able to see that the fire didn't get to their house um, is worth it uh, we want to try to be sensitive to people who have lost their homes anyway this um, the heat mapping pretty much is what just what it's showing is just that the fire hasn't really spread the last couple of days I uh, want to show some videos of the fire behavior and talk a little bit about this area. Um, you know, we're we're in this unique landscape here where we're really we're on the east side of the mountains, and so weed has a lot in common with, say, Susanville or um, Bend, Oregon, where we're really on. It's almost it's more desert than forest, and want to look at why that is. Uh, you know, if we jump out here and look at the big picture, here we're looking south towards the Central Valley. And then panning over here towards the ocean and so we've got the trinity alps and the marble mountains out in here it's really high country between the ocean and weed that wrings most of the moisture out of the landscape you know or out of the clouds before it gets here and then you've got mount shasta here off to the left and so you know it's kind of a setup for um strong south winds to kind of come up from the valley up the Sac upper Sacramento River and get kind of funneled between here. So the the location on the landscape kind of sets itself up. It's hot and dry. So um, as far as talking about what we can do about fuels management out here, you know, we have a lot of brush. We have a lot of ponderosa pine. One thing I noticed that I thought was really interesting during the fire was, um, I'm going to jump to a video here. We got some um, good video here from Michael Daly, who's a um, reporter out of Wairika. And this just shows uh, the fuels, the low kind of scrubby brush. And it also shows just how, uh, what a chaotic fire environment wind creates. Especially check out these kind of rolling uh, vortices along the edge of the fire. So one thing um, that I wanted to say about that video, um, and then I'm going to jump in and pull up another video here, is um, <coughs> here we've got a video from Michael Steinberg. Uh, Michael's a young photographer out of Chico, and he was on this fire. Um, <coughs> sorry. That goes on this fire early on. He shot this video in the evening. So this is, um, what's really interesting to me about this video is that we're talking about August here, um, or actually September, right? Um, super hot day with the wind. We saw that we had potential for really extreme fire behavior. And then the winds kind of mellow out. We got less sun on it, and we've got a basically a prescribed burn going on here. Not not saying that this is being done as a prescribed burn, but we've got fire effects here that are what you'd try to do with a prescribed burn of backing the fire into the wind. Um, you know, flame lengths less than a foot, right? So fire like this is going through and clearing clearing out all the brush and. Um, if we had a fire like this, um, you know, every couple of years in this area, uh, we wouldn't have the fire hazard that we just saw. So I just want to point out that in Ponderosa Pine on the east side, that um, the burn window is fairly large for Ponderosa Pine to burn in the winter, you know, in dry winter, um, burn in the spring, burn in the fall. Um, the wild card here is wind, obviously, but working your way into um, projects like this, it's one of the only solutions we have for treating fuels at the landscape scale. So I just think, you know, during these incidents, we see um, these big flame photos over and over, and people tend to think that that's the only thing you can do or that the woods are so overgrown that we can't um, use fire. But this is the day of the fire um, without some wind on a flank. And uh, prescribed fire is a solution that we can use in this particular landscape 
and the dry the dryness the winter it creates windows for us to burn uh, and we have a lot of these opportunities to use fire so there's a um, Siskiyou County prescribed burn associations getting formed up um, a lot of volunteer action happening around prescribed burning and um, we're big advocates of that around here okay jump out of there Got to make these chainsaws stop. Okay. Hang on a second. Yeah. I'm go. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to jump over now to um, the mountain fire. That's about all we have to report on the mill fire. The, um, there's an incident command team on the fire now. And they're... Um, kind of picking up the pieces, right? There's a ton of administrative work around um, doing the surveys of damaged homes, um, helping people kind of negotiate um, the, the aftermath, mopping up the fire, um, taking care of all kinds of business. So um, they've brought in a team and that's managing both the mill fire and the mountain fire. The team jumped right in and made some um, great maps last night. It's it's no short uh, order of work for these guys to show up and make like all the map products that you need for the briefing and the air ops and everything. So, kudos to them for um, getting there and getting it set up quickly. You know, I think one of the interesting things about this landscape, and we talked about it during our live stream during the fire, is just that it takes so long for a bunch of resources to get here um, that when we had the Bulls fire and we have a fire like this, that oftentimes the fire is really kind of done what it w w is going to do before we even get all our resources mustered and that's just the nature of this area and it's kind of what we call like the fire regime it means how an area burns how often it burns and what it burns like and wind driven fires are kind of a fact of life here so um i saw that retired chief quigley um, had made some comments on his facebook page about the fuels management problem and he noted that uh, the Siskiyou unit that we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars fighting fire in the Siskiyou unit in the last decade and we've spent a fraction of that on fuels management and he was just really um, passionately asking that we really focus on fuels so like I said prescribed burning is part of that uh, mastication of brush is part of that and it can all kind of work together where you do mastication around um, places that are too tricky to burn you do thinning but then you um, get to a place where you can use fire more safely so if you're interested in any of that, I encourage you to reach out and uh, get information on the new Prescribed Burn Association for Siskiyou County. So to jump out from here, we're going to go over to the Mountain Fire. Mountain Fire is um, not far away at all. Burning here on top of the divide really between Scott Valley and Shasta Valley. And I'll address comments, um, see a bunch of comments over there. I'll, I'll address those um, as soon as we're done kind of with the, over, the overview briefing. Okay, so Fort Jones, Aetna, Callahan, the road to Gazelle. This fire is kind of burning along that road. I'm going to show some more video from Michael Daly. Oh, that's Steinberg's name up there, Daly. Um, this video has gotten a lot of play. And... Um, it definitely falls into the category of big flames, high drama, um, but it's it's um, it's worth watching. This is early on. He's driving um, south on the Gazelle Callahan Road down into the burn, and the rotation of the column here is uh, remarkable. Um, it tells you a lot about the stability of the the atmosphere. So he's dropping down here, and I think you know one thing that's interesting about this video to me. You can see the spot fires out ahead. But one thing I notice in here is that all that black oak. Um, it's interesting, you know, black oak is one of the most uh, widely spread oaks in California. And it's also um, a really important food source for people and turkeys and animals. Um, but where you find black oak, you've always had people there. And I think a lot of what we've kind of called fuels management over the years, um, we could also call 
um, oak restoration. You know, um, people in oak, have, they've got a really intimate relationship. And a lot of these lands that were, are tended now with, that are, they were having these big fires that have always been tended by fire, uh, by people. So I'm jumping to give you one other video from him, uh, Michael Daly. So there's um, there's some some nice stands of timber here. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, as you kind of move uh, farther up into the north of the fire here, a lot of the timberland has just really um, been cut over over the last hundred years. What one other thing that's interesting in the area where this fire starts, first got going is that it's kind of in the canyon and the radiant heat within that canyon, you know, is uh, fire kind of drives itself or it's burning on both sides of a canyon. Um, you've got the heat of one flank uh, on one side heating the other side and they kind of can drive each other. So the first, the run of the first part of the fire was kind of wind driven up this draw. And now that the fire has kind of become established on top of the mountain, um, we don't have that same dynamic of having um, the ability for the fire to run up slope. And that's, that'll affect um, really kind of the potential of the fire to make huge runs. But I think coming back to the oak and the pines here, it's just that this, um, this is really what we call east side conditions. You know, when the first time I drove this road, I dropped in and I felt like I was dropping into Eagle Lake or, um, you know, something near Nevada, you know, on the ragged edge. And it made me realize just that the, that effect of, um, you know, the Marble Mountains and everything rising up, it does create this real unique kind of uh, forest here, dry forest, and it's a fire dependent forest. So, you know, when we look at the fire history map around here, we just don't have any fire history for a long, long time. And so then that's what we get is uh, we get these thick overstock forests um, that just, we get fire. We've been so good at putting fire out in here that just on these, on the bad day where there's nothing we can do, then we lose it all. So back to the map of this fire. Here's the Gazelle Calhoun Road. And that video that we saw of the big flames was like I drive in down into here as this was burning on the first day. So on the first day, the fire kind of followed the road um, south to north. Yesterday, um, early in the morning, the fire um, kind of blew up out of here and became established kind of over the ridge. And it was too smoky most of the day yesterday, so we're looking west here. And then last night, um, you know, afternoon and evening, the fire kind of made a big push out here to the west. So it's just, it's well established in these drainages here. And what happens when it you know makes a push like this is that you know we probably had dozers. I don't know if there was already line pushed, but there was opportunity here to to run dozers off this ridge and pick it up. And then once it slops over like this, then you don't have that opportunity anymore. And it depends on the train. Uh, but a lot of the time, you know, we, we don't, aren't going to get a chance necessarily to run dozers on the mid slope to pick up something like this. So just every time we lose a ridge like that, <coughs> it, um, it takes away, it takes away opportunities for control. So, you know, kind of early on in the fire like this, we're looking out at where's the next ridge that um, you can kind of make a stand. It's so sparse out here that that, um, that buys some advantage, but it also is just so hot and dry that um, spotting can really drive the fire here. So there's nothing really tidy about the edge of the fire. Um, the fire didn't spread here. On, we're looking at the north end of the fire now, and it didn't spread a lot on the north end yesterday. It was kind of backing down into this next drainage on the north. But once it gets to this size, um, you can't always necessarily, you know, this is, these ridge tops are some good dozer ground. Um, that doesn't do us any good when the fire gets down in here. You know, maybe we'll push a dozer line down through these clear cuts. Um, but once it hits a certain kind of threshold, then uh, there's kind of a, a popular saying, it's like, don't go out, don't just go to the next ridge with your thinking, go to the next ridge where you have time to make a difference, time to implement your strategy. So, you know, if 
if we push this ridge um, but don't have time to go out and you know cut snags or get adequately prepped before this gets here then we've wasted our time so you know maybe this road at the bottom is is a place that um firing will occur as we've mentioned before um cal fire um one of their biggest charges is to uh, work for the private timber companies and protect private timber land and so though you may have an opportunity to come down here and uh light off this road um to keep you know if the fire becomes well established out in here um no one wants to do that no one wants to burn up this timber um but when it comes down to it on fires that uh, where we don't have good direct options firing is what stops big fires so it's just under the hot and dry conditions we have right now it's kind of a no-win situation for for operations people because if they keep going direct and they keep getting spotted over they waste a lot of time and the fire still gets away if they go indirect and light a firing operation you're giving up a lot of ground to the fire and you still might lose it. You might light a firing operation on this road here and have the winds carried over. And then, um, not only have you lost all this ground, but you move the fire that much farther forward. So I definitely don't envy the people that have to make the strategies on these big fires. Um, uh, and it's all driven by conditions on the ground. You know, it's really hard for us to look at this and tell you, um, from afar, um, uh, whether or not it's safe to, to throw a, a crew down this or whether or not you can put a dozer on this ridge or even how much the spotting is going on. But the indices, the weather is what drives spotting and we're hot and we're dry and all it takes is a little wind and some torching and you've got long range spotting. Yesterday they had a little bit of opportunity with um, tankers and they got in here and um, they did some pretreatment on these ridges and de it depends on the fuels how effective the pretreatment is going to be. If a fire, you know, makes a run up out of here, um, and you've got some retardant on the ridge, it really depends on the fuel loading and the spotting potential and everything else of whether or not that's going to work. Uh, pretreating ridges way out from the fire often is kind of just, hey, we we only have this is the only opportunity we have to put some mud on the ground. Let's do it. But um, unless you have time to put in a fire line. Uh, it's um, it's not a real high uh, probability success just pre-treating a ridge. That said, the air tanker, the air attack people are good. They know what they're doing, and they're uh, they're trying to you know pick the best plan. They're rarely just you know painting a ridge for the sake of it. Anyway, that's the the mountain fire. We'll keep watching it. Um, you know, we're we're interested in tactics on this on this channel. Um, and we want people to understand why things get done the way they do get done. You know, there's a lot of talk like, well, if they just went out and put the damn fire out, we wouldn't have to fire off this whole watershed. And it's like, okay, well, we've got a bunch of resources on us as fast as we could. And the fire and the conditions define the options. So we'll be watching this and um, tell you the story of what's happening with it. We're going to jump out from here and uh, fly north up to the Rum Creek fire. Once we get up here in Oregon, we've got all these blue uh, polygons turned on. These are fire history of the last 10 years. And uh, also, uh, if you're just kind of joining our rum coverage, um, we've been covering this fire for about 10 days. It's been a kind of interesting and kind of slow motion affair. This blue to the south is a fire that burned in 2018, Taylor Creek fire. And we're going to come in here kind of, um, we're starting to kind of look a little northwest up the Rogue River. The town of Galice is out in here. And, um, so let's look at it north. So what we've got here is black is the area that's been burned. White is the perimeter from the last two days. And so where you see white perimeter on the edge of the fire, that means the fire has not moved in two days. So this whole southeast flank of the fire is looking really good. Um, no new spread there. The only little spread we've got is kind of up here in the head of, um, I think it's Stafford Creek. And there's a little bit of backing fire here in this steep area that, um, that we've been watching. Uh, coming around to the north side of the fire, no movement. 
until we get out in this drainage. And we've been watching this drainage for a while just because this is one of those places where the train isn't giving firefighters a lot of options for going direct on this uh, steep slope. So we've seen steady growth here every day. Um, here's yesterday and here's 48 hours previous. This is like one of two areas on the fire that are still active. Okay, so we're looking at the north end of the fire and kind of coming around to like Rainy Falls on the Rogue River and we've been watching them fire this kind of steep dozer line and hand line here down to the Rainy Falls. Um, that's all co cooling off. Um, looks like it's, they've finished the firing there. Uh, they've put black line on the map now for this stretch along the Rogue where the fire backed down about 10 days ago. And then we've been watching the fire also kind of uh, burn fairly freely here in the bottom of Rum Creek. And just kind of doing the kind of same fire behavior we've been seeing in like uh, the Six Rivers and on this fire also just the slow, steady kind of backing and flanking and really steep ground where there's not great control options. So coming around to look at just kind of the northwest quarter of this fire, which has been the kind of interesting part now for a while, we started talking, um, you know, over a week ago about their options for controlling this part of the fire. Turn on my roads here. There's this mid slope road through here. And early on we wondered if that might be a place that we could control the fire. And there's a couple spots it worked and then there's some spots where it just, it didn't. So Kind of early on, we saw those old dozer lines and we thought they're probably going to do an indirect line. So that's kind of what they've been doing here in Rum Creek is um, they pushed a dozer line out this major ridge system and they've been firing this over the past week. And they're making progress here. And what we've been talking about, they've got hand line down the river out here, um, probably from a previous fire. You can see this area here burned, you know, in the last 15 years or so. So they're just taking their time, getting depth, and burning out of here. And their main thing, kind of scheduling-wise on this, is just that they have to keep ahead of the fire in Rum Creek. You know, this fire, as it's been burning, they've been, you know, they need to get depth out here before it can make slope-driven runs. Anyway, that's kind of Rum Creek for you. It's, um, it's one of those, um, you know, watching a lot of this stuff, it's kind of slow motion. And that's just, um, that's just tactics of um, trying to keep ahead of the fire, trying to get enough depth to your line. So if something blows up out in here, you're, uh, you're ahead of it. And also trying to put fire on the ground in a sensible way that uh, creates good outcomes, good fire effects. You know, trying to get as much depth as you can without nuking things. You know, and we've made a lot of progress on that in the last 30 or 40 years of firefighters and ops people starting to think about the the consequences of their firing operations. A lot of that's been driven by public pressure. You know, um, in the 1980s around Hayfork, there were some backfires that were just lit at the bottom of the hill and that caused huge patches of high severity fire. And so if you think about it, you know, like if we just came down here, if we, if we built a fire line down this ridge, dragged fire down it, and then just came and lit the bottom of this hill, yeah, we would contain the fire. We would have black and uh, the fire would be, you know, safely contained, but we'd kill all the trees on that slope. So in like in Hayfork in the eighties in the Klamath, um, there were places where firing got done from the bottom of the hill, killed all the trees. And then there were big salvage sales uh, of old growth and, and people saying like, Hey, like people must be on the take here. If they like did this, you know, does their buddy own a timber company? There was a lot of backlash to that. And even in the Klamath in uh, 2008, where we had big fires there, there was a lot of firing there that um, the locals were concerned caused a lot of the high severity fire. And so talking to some veteran firefighters, they've, you know, they'll tell you like, you know, I learned a lot with prescribed burning that I use on wildfires. You know, if we're going to fire this out, um, can we make our way down? Can we um, use drones or get crews out here and put some fire on the ground to back it down like we would with the prescribed fire? And so it's, um, you know, I think it's good to remember that the people that know the most about firing, the hotshot crews and the people that do it all the time, um, they have a lot to teach us about firing on prescribed burns. And there's a lot of potential crossover as we train 
a more and more agile prescribed burning workforce. We're going to have more and more talented people that know how to use fire um, tactically. That's going to make us all better firefighters. Last thing I want to jump to here is uh, Cedar Creek fire. That's Rum Creek. If you're up there and you're evacuated or worried about it, um, hopefully our information is, um, is helping you kind of understand what's going on, why it's taking so long. And um, you know, the firefighters here have had a lot of hard work that they've done under really hot, dry conditions. And um, outcomes so far look pretty good. All right. Hey, there's a fire up there. Um, so we're going to come up here, Cedar Creek fire. This is burning in an area I don't really know very well, uh, Waldo Lake Wilderness. This fire has been burning for a while. Sorry, I'm having trouble flying here. So just kind of give you the big picture. Um, here's Oak Ridge. Here's Bend. Um, Crescent Lake. Shamalt would be over here. Vida, Nimrod, uh, kind of the McKinsey River corridor out in here. So this is burning in a pretty remote area and it's been burning for like a, a month or something. But it made a big run in the last couple of days. We're kind of doubled in size. And I don't really know much about what's happening on this fire. I just want to show you the mapping. Uh, we can do a little more research into it. But it kind of, over the past you know month or so, burned out this way. And now um, here's this white line shows where it was a couple days two days ago and this is all new spread this is one of those fires where it's kind of right off the bat contained by lava and lake on portions of it but the concern on this fire is just that we're into the east wind season now and we've got all this land out here to the west that didn't burn in recent fires so holiday farm fire um in 2020 started here and ran like 20 miles in one big kind of wind event evening, devastated communities all along the McKenzie River. So it's concerning to have a big fire hanging out up here with so much out to the west of it going into east wind season. So I don't, I'm kind of uninformed as to what the tactics are um, and what's going on in this fire, but we're going to do a little research on it and we'll, we'll have a little bit more um, to tell you about it. I wanted to talk a little bit about this fire up here, the holiday farm fire, um, just all those fires in 2020 were driven by one big east wind event. You can see this fire here, um, Beachy Creek fire, um, Holiday Farm fire, the um, Riverside fire, and the something else creek fire. You know, major landscape scale uh, events. And one thing we really saw in those fires was that they just devastated a ton of uh, commercial timberland where the fire just ran through all these young stands. And so Oregon's kind of having a reckoning with wildfire. You know, the west side of the Oregon, we've, I think, gotten used to thinking of it being wet and a place that we don't have big fires. And then uh, we've just seen huge losses in the timberland there. And I think it's just like California, it's forcing this reckoning in forestry of how, what can you, can you really get away with growing a crop that takes 40 or 50 years in a place that might have a fire every 15 to 20 years. So that's something we're going to be covering here coming up um, in the next month or so on the lookout is just uh, looking at how the forestry industry is adapting to climate change and adapting to new fire realities. Anyway, that's the Cedar Creek fire. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. I'll, I'll start taking some questions. A lot, of, a lot of comments. Hey, folks. Someone says, if my home had burned, I'd want to know right away. This is good info to share. Uh, do I have any wind predictions for the Rum Creek Fire? I don't. Um, I like the windy.com website. Um, I use that quite a bit. Um, someone says, I'd rather see what's going on no matter what. And when I hear about my property, someone has to tell you at some time, not knowing was worse. Knowing it's gone is just part of moving forward. Thanks, Gail. Um, B. Bloom wants to know something about containment. What does it mean? 
Um, containment is what firefighters put on the map when they feel like they could walk away from the fire and just leave it. So, you know, you can have a section of fire line that's cold, but if there's still snags that have, you know, that are smoldering or if there's, you know, material up the hill that could roll down across the line, you don't really call something contained until you're ready to stop staffing it and patrolling it. Uh, so when, so it takes a long time to, to show stuff as contained. It's kind of, also, it's like the kind of what day are we going home? So if you have a team that's on a fire and they think that they're going to be there another week and they're 50% containment, they might just like increase containment 7% a day. Um, looking out like they know that it's going to take them a week to do their paperwork and um, have their public meetings and everything else. And so they'll sometimes just kind of uh, prorate, prorate it. You know, Hey, we're going to be here another week. Um, even if the fire is kind of already out. So it's, um, you know, I've been on fires that were completely out, but they're saying it's 20% contained just because they know they need to stay there and kind of wrap things up, clean up all the hose. When you say a fire is contained, you lose a lot of your resources. And so sometimes with containment, people play games, you know, like we're going into this crazy heat wave um, in Northern California and maybe we'll pop some fires in Southern California and Northern California they might not want to give up a lot of their resources. So we might say that there's a big fire. We might just say, Hey, let's not call it contained until after the weekend. Cause we want to keep these resources here. So games get played with it. It's a political number. Sometimes the fire is out. It, generally a Cal fire fire. If they say it's 30% contained, uh, you know, in grass and brush, it means it's out and they're just mopping it up. Lots of games get played. It's, it's a political number. Um, There's a fire labeled in Wairika. I don't know anything about it. Um, someone says that Siskiyou County Library has a series of books about the small towns in the county and history and interviews and a lot of stuff about fires. Uh, Goose Nest Fire was a big one. Uh, day three in InsaWeb doesn't have a Miller Mountain Fire on their web page. Um, these fires are being run by Cal Fire, so you're probably your best bet is to go to the Cal Fire website. Uh, they don't, you know, Cal Fire fires do end up on InsaWeb, but InsaWeb is kind of more um, used by the feds. So I would check out the Cal Fire stuff. Uh, it does take time for the, the public info people to get up and running. These teams, you know, from all over the state. So you bring in a team from a Cal Fire team, and there's people rolling from San Diego, driving 12 hours or more to get here. So it, and as we've seen, it takes a while for the CAL FIRE and agency public information machine to get rolling. And then once they do get rolling, if you've got a press release or something that you want to put out there, like it's got to go to Sacramento and be approved by headquarters, basically. So that's why um, it takes a long time for the public info people to get out info and then everything's so political, especially when structures burn. People are just super careful and delicate about what they say. So, um, it's just them. That's them trying to net. It's, I don't, I don't envy the agency public information officers having to navigate all the politics and protocol and everything else they have to, it makes their job almost impossible to share good timely information. Someone says, how did the fire erupt off the side of the highway spontaneous ignition? Um, it's all suspicious, you know, when a fire starts right by a road, it could just be something trailer chains or something else. But, um, and we don't really get into speculating here on fire causes. Um, all right. That's about all we got right now. Um, Thanks everyone. Thanks for supporting the lookout. Uh, yeah, we're supported by you, the viewers. So, um, if you like our stuff and want to help support it, go to um, the dash lookout.org 
and um you can become a subscriber there you can read our other stuff and um keep on top of what we're doing uh it helps pay for things like me going out and interviewing people and spending time editing and everything else thanks for joining us and uh if you're evacuated good luck hope you get to go home soon <laughs>